coming up. How to stop wasting time in making progress in your professional world. And then is imposter syndrome actually good for you? Shark Tank's Barbara Corkin goes viral and I'll break it down. Helping you grow personally so that you can advance professionally and lead effectively. This is the Ken Coleman Show. All right, let's talk about this. How do we stop wasting precious time in our life? Now, this is personal for me because, boy, oh, boy, did I do it and I still regret it. I need to get over that regret because it shaped me, but I'm going to be real transparent today. A story that I've shared a few times on the show. For years, I had gotten the idea, you know, I had gotten some confirmation and had sat with it for a couple of years that I was supposed to be in broadcasting. But at the same time, that same amount of time, four years, I didn't do anything about it. I didn't do anything about it. So I'm in this, this zone of life where I have clarity on what I want to do, broadcasting. I know in my heart of hearts, even in my most doubt-filled days, I know I have the tools. And the question is, would it work? And so there's where I kept getting stuck. Out. I'm in my early 30s. I don't have a degree. I don't have a lot of connections. I've never done it before. If I do this, I'm going to fall flat on my face. And so this would keep me up night after night after night after night, keep me down in the dumps during the day because I tried a little thing here, tried to get in here, tried to get in here, little sporadic moments. I would motivate myself. I'd put myself out there and nothing really happened. So what was happening? The sting of rejection just smacking me, sting of rejection. And no one likes to get rejected. So I'm going to take it to the moment, the defining moment for me. The way that my day would go at that time is, is we had three littles under the age of four. And so I would help with them in the morning, get them up and breakfast with my wife. We did a team, a tag team situation. And then they'd be off and running on their day. And then I would go down into the basement because we could lock the door where they, they couldn't come down and bug daddy. And I would work down in the basement and we had a beautiful patio that was very private, facing a common area that was all woods. And this was like I had my own little track of land, and it was unbelievably peaceful. And this was a spring morning, and the birds were chirping, the sun was shining, and it was great. It was a beautiful day. And I had a cup of coffee with me. I had my laptop and my pencil and my moleskin, and that was my routine. And before I would start the work, I would just do some reflection and some reading and to get my mind right to get into the day ahead. Now, keep in mind, I'm not doing dream job stuff. I'm just doing day job stuff. It was not exciting work. So I wanted to get in a good frame of mind. And I wanted to start the day. And so I would pray and do my devotions, and I would reflect and write some little notes to myself. And so this particular morning, I just was down. I'm not making any progress. This is never going to happen. I am absolutely, completely consumed with self-doubt. In other words, what they now call imposter syndrome. I was tired of making no progress, tired of losing sleep, tired of getting rejected. Uh, and, and it was fear and doubt just pounding on me. Fear of getting rejected again. Doubt that it was even going to pay off if I kept at it. And so I've got this internal wrestling match going on, right? My heart's going, stay in it, stay in it. Come on, get out there. My head's going, I don't want to feel rejection again. I don't want to feel like a loser, like an imposter again. My head's going, it's not worth it. Why in the world, Coleman, are you going to stay with it? You're in your early 30s. No one's going to hire you to do anything broadcasting. You're too old. You're too far behind. This is what my head's telling me. My heart's going, just try, just try, just stay in it. And so I'm in this pity party. And I started rolling through in my mind. This person said they were going to make a connection. They never did it. This person, I had a good meeting. I thought they were going to give me a chance, and they never got back to me. And I was just counting up the losses, focusing on the losses. This person didn't do this. And this So what was I doing? Projecting out here. It's everybody else's fault. I did what I should do. I showed up. It's too late. And then it hit me. 
just like a ton of bricks. I'm sitting there, and Joe's heard this story 50,000 times, but this is exactly what happened. I took a sip of coffee, and I was staring into the woods, and I had been just in this cycle of everybody that let me down and didn't do this and do this, and all of a sudden I wrote this, and I'll never forget it. This is what I wrote. No one is sitting around thinking about how they can help Ken Coleman reach his broadcasting dream. I wrote it in my moleskin. And I don't know why that particular note stuck with me, but it stuck with me. And it hit me right between the eyes, between the chest, and I was like, whoa. And it was just a simple reminder. Everybody else has got a lot going on. Those people aren't the bad guys and bad girls. They didn't do anything wrong to you. They got a lot going on. And the last thing that they're thinking about when they woke up this morning is, how can I help Ken Coleman get into broadcasting? So I'm going to share this with you. Nobody in this world has woke, woke up this morning and said, how can I help this person get their life, the life they want, the job they want, the advance that they want, the leadership position they want? I'm telling you, nobody's thinking about it. And so I had to realize that my dream, in order to realize the dream, it's an old phrase, realize the dream. In other words, to make the dream a reality, if it was going to happen, it was going to have to be up to me. If it is to be, it is up to me, the old phrase says, and I was going to have to make a move. So you know what I did? I decided right then and there, I've got to do more. Now let me fast forward into the near future. I started a podcast on a whim, an idea called One Question where I took one question out of all these interviews I had been privileged to do for a leadership company. They, they gave me permission, and I launched the One Question podcast. You don't even know that story, do you, Alex? It was Ready for this? It was a four- or five-minute podcast. I put out one a week, and it was just one question and one answer. It was a little bit of music bump, horribly produced. And then I would come in and go, I had the opportunity to sit down with Malcolm Gladwell, one of the great thinkers in all the world. The New Yorker called him blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, Time, Time Magazine called him Top 100 Thinkers of America. And I asked him about this. Here's what he said. And I rolled the, the, uh, the answer, and that was the end of the podcast. Well, this thing kind of took off a little bit. It was a Snickers bar. People liked it. It wasn't huge, but it did okay. Guess what? That turned into a, my first book deal. And then not long after that, I met Joe Hankin when I paid my way onto WDUN, 250 bucks for poor Joe to sit there and listen to me for an hour, learn how to do radio. Here's the point. I started doing stuff and things started happening for me. Did you catch that? That's brilliant, isn't it? I just started doing stuff and trying stuff and things started happening. So can I just be very honest with you today from my heart? When you move, God moves and other people move too. Let me say that again. When you move, God moves, and other people do too. That's what I believe to my core. You know, you got to look at your professional advancement as a chess game. You ever played chess before? It's fun, isn't it? And guess what? If I'm playing Nathan in chess this afternoon, which we should do sometime with a good cigar, um... At multiple times, in fact, the entire match, once we get started, I got to make a move. Then Nathan makes a move. And then I make a move. So the other player cannot make a move until you make a move. And this is the professional growth challenge. If I move, God moves and other people move. So here's my challenge to you today. Very simple little process that I've mentioned more times than I can imagine. Learn something every week. Do something with what you learn every week. And then connect with somebody that you need to connect with. I want you to learn something every day if you can, or certainly during a week. I want you to think of how you can do something with what you're learning. And then I want to make sure that you're connecting with somebody, maybe even in that area of where I'm learning and doing. Here's why I give that simple framework. And this has been a popular post on social media. And here's how I frame it. 
because I do this every Sunday night. I sit down and I go, what's the one thing I want to learn this week? Now, it's not always just one thing, but I start with going, what do I want to learn this week? What do I want to do this week? And who do I want to connect with this week? Now, watch what's happening. Sometimes they're connected. Sometimes they aren't. Sometimes it's just separate things. Well, I want to learn this this week, and then I want to do this this week, and then I need to connect with this. I want to connect with this person this week. Learn, do, connect. Here's what it does. It gets you out of your head, and it gets you in the game. This is a formula for forward movement. Learn something, do something, connect with somebody. Learn something, do something, connect with somebody. Well, who do I want to, what do I want to learn? What do I want to do? Who do I want to connect with? This is going to get you off the back porch and out in the game, and things are going to move on your behalf. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about one of our viewers, Nick. He was a high school chemistry teacher, not making enough for his wife to stay home with their kids like they wanted, and he needed a change. A friend told him about a tech job, and a few days later, Nick also heard about Bethel Tech and their full-stack development program on this show. So he enrolled. He got in, he crushed it, he got hired before he even finished, and now, ready for this, makes $20,000 more with opportunities to make up to $150,000. So what does your life look like a year from now if you were to move into tech? Will you bet on yourself like Nick did? For as little as $5,000 in just 15 weeks of your time, you can learn a skill that will land you a great job in tech. And remember, Ken Coleman viewers get a 10% discount. To find out more, go to BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. All right, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Okay, a viral video from Barbara Corcoran of Shark Tank fame uh, was brought to me. And this is pretty interesting. I think it's a really, really good discussion. We've been talking about imposter syndrome and doubt. And uh, she went viral uh, talking about her own experience with imposter syndrome. Watch this. If you're struggling with imposter syndrome, good for you. Thank the Lord in heaven that you have imposter syndrome because what that guarantees is you're going to try harder than the next guy. And it's in the trying that you find your confidence. I am confident. I know it. I don't feel it, but I know I am because I've tried 5 million times to build my confidence. And guess what? I guess it's real. I have to believe what the majority says, not what I think. Okay. But my success is entirely, entirely due to my insecurity. I get what she's saying. I really do. But I, I, I'm going to suggest, very respectfully, more needs to be said. What she is saying is correct that every achiever, entrepreneur, shark, everybody deals with imposter syndrome. I'm so sick of that phrase. But we'll use it because it's the popular vernacular now. But she's right. And I've said this before. Anybody that is thinking about moving forward on something or in the act of moving forward, is going to encounter imposter syndrome or doubt, okay? But I, I just got to say this, um, because you're not an imposter if you have doubt. You're a doer. Doers deal with doubt. Let me tell you who doesn't deal with doubt. Bleacher creatures, people that sit on the bleachers of life, watch everybody else. They don't deal with doubt. You know why? There's nothing to doubt because they're not doing any freaking thing. That's why. So the very function of thinking about doing, planning to do, executing on the do, doing itself brings doubt with it because you're you're, you're stretching, you're moving forward on something. You don't know what the, the outcome is going to be. This is very simple. You guys get this. So when she says things like this, I'm going like, okay, yes, she's right about that, but she's wrong to say that you need to use your insecurity and it will motivate you. And I, I get what she's saying, but that's an incomplete statement. In other words, what she should have said, and I think this is what she means, if you identify the source of your insecurity or doubt and you build that muscle of 
breaking through doubt, then it gives you the strength to keep going, and thus you build on it. So I, I'm not actually trying to disagree with it. I'm just saying we got to understand there's actually a way to push through doubt. You cannot remove doubt. I've talked about this before on the show. You cannot remove doubt. If you're moving forward or thinking about going forward, planning to go forward, you are going to face doubt because it's just the simple concern or worry that if I move forward, it won't work. That's all doubt is. I do not believe in a moment of doubt. Now remember, a moment is the key. I don't believe in this moment of doubt. You can call it insecurity all you want to. I don't have enough, whatever. But I don't believe that I can do this thing. I don't believe that this thing I want to do will happen. I don't believe that anything good will come out of this. It's not possible. Now, okay, so it's important to understand that when we encounter doubt, that we also don't just go, ah, this isn't about muscling up to doubt. This is actually digging into doubt and building that muscle to dig into doubt. To answer the question, is doubt correct or is doubt false? Is doubt telling me the truth or is it lying to me? Let me give you an example. If you attempt to do some really hard sporting event that you have no training and no identifiable skill in, and you got some doubts right before you do it, is doubt lying to you? Or is doubt attempting to protect you from humiliation and frustration? The answer is, it's protecting you. Okay? So, uh, I've used a, a, an old example. For, I'll use a new example. So, if I show up on the pickleball court this weekend, and one of the guys out there that is out there, and, 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 and we're out there before everybody else, and he says to me, uh, you want to do a one-on-one match, and I know how good that player is, and I know that he is significantly higher rated than I am. I've played with him, against him, and I know that he's really, really good. And he got there, and he goes, you want to play? And I have some doubt about, do I want to get into a one-on-one match with this guy and have him run me around and beat me 11-1 to or 11-0? Just using a simple example, is doubt lying to me there, or is doubt telling me the truth? Doubt's telling me the truth. The guy is de- de- just de- demonstrably better than me. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's like, here's another example. I'm not a good golfer. Nathan, if I go out to a celebrity golf tour and I'm hitting off the first tee and there's 3,000 people around the first tee and I doubt whether I can get this ball up in the air and not kill somebody, can I just tell you right now, doubt is saying, don't do this. You're going to humiliate yourself. That's what doubt's going to say. So, let's flip that. If I've got some skill, and I've got some experience, and I've got some some real-life testimonies of people saying, Ken, you're good at this. You can do this. You can do broadcasting. Go back to my story. Ken, you're a good communicator. You've got the basics. You just got to get in there and do it. I remember Joe said to me, like, after the first show, I looked at him, and he's he's five feet away from me, and I look at him, and I go, dude, please tell me I'm not wasting my time or money. Do you remember me saying that to you? And and he said to me, no, man, listen, most people can't do what you just did their first time and do an hour. You, you're you going to be fine, man. Stay with it. That's what he said to me. So if I take what he said, and he'd been producing people for years, and he's been in the game, if I go, okay, this is what Joe said, and then this is what I believe. And then I got some evidence over here and over here and over here. Wait a second. I still have doubt, but doubt saying, Ken, this is a waste of time. This is really stupid. You shouldn't do this. And that was a lie because, folks, I'm now where I am only because I showed up in Gainesville on Saturday afternoons at 2 o'clock. So the idea is let's go to a very simple analogy. When we're dealing with doubt, how do we – do what Barbara Corcoran says that the great entrepreneurs do. What they do is, is they persevere and they break through doubt. And here's how they do it. I'm not saying this is their process, but this is how you do it. You take the voice of doubt. Doubt is saying this. So you know what we do? 
We put it up on the witness stand like you would in some legal movie or show, and you say, this is what Dowd is saying. And Dowd is saying that I can't do radio. Ken, it's a waste of time. You're too old. You don't have enough talent. You're not going to catch a break. I had all these things, folks. These are real. And I no, I wish I had done it this way, but it's like I should have wrote all those things down and gone, is that true? Is there any evidence that this is true? And if the answer is there's no evidence, then guess what? Doubt is lying to me, and I need to keep moving forward. And what happens is each time I move forward in the face of doubt, that's when I build the muscle up to learn how to process doubt and then press on through doubt. It can be powerful if you know how to deal with it. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. If you ever want to get coached up, you can do that by calling in. You can leave a voicemail or you can email us. Uh, leave a voicemail at 844-747-2577. 844-747-2577. You can email the show, ask at KenColeman.com. Amaris is on the line in Hartford, Connecticut. Amaris, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. How are Thank you? Thank you for having me. You I'm bet. well. Good. How about you? You know, I can't complain. And you wouldn't want to hear it anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what's up? Well, uh, I have been dreading just going to my job every day and oh, no. don't want to keep going into life that way, you know? Yes, and I do. It's just not a way to live your life. And I really want to live out my purpose for yeah. what I need to be and help people and what I'm gifted and talented for. And I feel like... I came in to my job one day and it just hit me like, why, why am I at this job? Interesting. What, how, how long ago was that? Honestly, this started last year and I've been working as a receptionist at the same health center for four years now, starting this month. What happened? Or, or should I ask, should I ask, um, what was your emotion like prior to that day when it just hit you? I just felt complete burnout and overwhelm. I think that's when it just hit me the following day. I'm just thinking. Uh, so my point I is, is yeah, I get that. But I'm saying, was it was it better? Was it good? And then all of a sudden, bam! Or was it just the realization that it had been slowly getting worse, and you and then you realize one day, oh, this crept up on me. I'm trying to get a handle on yeah, on what it came changed like a snowball effect like completely getting more worse and worse honestly Got not it. getting better and then at one point so really you knew it was getting worse but yeah. you were kind of biting your lip and then one day you hit the wall and you went i can't keep this up yeah okay got it and yet you have for another year right yeah okay bless your heart what's it what's uh, what are you experiencing now on the way into work i'd love our audience if you don't mind just to share you share with our audience what you're feeling driving in and walking in? I think my mentality is just, okay, I have this job. I need to provide. I need to do what I need as an adult and just go ahead and get the job done. But at the same time, it's like you can't keep saying that to yourself continuously. Yeah. And then when you're feeling just this dread and it just, you can only tell yourself so many times. Yeah. So I just come to that point that uh, I'm like feeling depressed sometimes and just feeling anxious yeah. and stressed. Yeah. So that's kind of what right. continues. So what do you think is keeping you there a year after you realized I'm at my breaking point? I think honestly, doubts and fear. Um thinking, is there something else? Could I even venture out to something else? Um, I'm going to be honest, I've been comfortable. Uh, and I'm so used to doing what I'm doing, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, but you're miserable. You're comfortable yeah. and miserable at the same time. You're comfortable yeah. in you can pretty much do this thing with half your brain engaged. Is that is that right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you know what sucks about that is your heart's completely disengaged. Yeah, and then right. I see that in my work. Yeah. Yeah, of course you do. So 
when I asked you what's keeping you from it, you said fear and doubt, and I love your honesty. And the way I define fear is I'm worried that something bad is going to happen if I step out of my comfort zone. Does that feel right to you? Yeah. Yeah. And doubt is I don't believe that something good is out there for me. So I'm just going to suck it up and deal with misery. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it does. All right. So let's 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 hone in on what I think you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about, which is other options. And I want to really see if you've got a couple of ideas of what you would like to do that if fear and doubt didn't exist, you'd be waltzing in there with a bit of a sachet. Is that making sense? Yeah. All right, let's forget fear and doubt for a moment. We'll come back to them. What is it? What are a couple of possibilities you've thought about or you maybe even long for, but fear and doubt are keeping you from going after it? Well, I thought of going back to school. I love learning. I love reading. I love writing. And but school's like, not going to pay. No. So I'm, I want to go beyond school. Go to school to yeah. do fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, I just thought of little small positions. If I can do something that that actually. Um, goes through my passion, which is I would love to tutor uh, kids. And because I, again, I work at a health center, which is with a pediatric office. So I love working with kids and youth. So you love, um, you love instructing, guiding, encouraging. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Oh, wow. Did you hear that? <laughs> Amaris, did you hear yourself? Yeah. You, let, let me, let, you have been like, uh, 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 the whole call. And when I asked you if you want to instruct, guide, encourage, you went, yes, that was amazing. <laughs> so Amaris, we're, we have got the tuning fork. So do you have to go to school to start tutoring? Technically, no. If I could do it, starting volunteering and building experience wait a second what what would be the areas that um let's say let's say you and i lived let's say i lived in hartford and uh, Mm -hmm. my wife knew you from church or from something 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 and and our kids needed a tutor and and she was talking to you about it what would she say that our kids were struggling with where you would go oh i can help them What, what would what would she have to say what would our kids need that you would go oh i can help with that to say that oh, I just really need this help with my kid, just succeeding in that, and I'll, I would just say yes. I would no, love to no, help I'm, I'm sorry, I'm doing a horrible job. What, what, <laughs> what subject matter do you go? I can help your kid. Uh, it would be writing. Yeah, just creative writing. What else? Um, even uh, I've helped kids with math. Uh, Anything that's within, yeah, math, writing. You got me now? You see what I'm doing? We're creating a menu. Amaris, if you, I tried to create a scenario where you got out of your head. Yeah. So my whole point was you can help kids at certain levels. You know what your limitations are on math. You know what your limitations are on creative writing. Like, so for instance, all I'm trying to get at is where are you gifted? Where do you have a pretty good strength of knowledge fundamental knowledge combined with the fact that you can teach and instruct and encourage just about anybody. So now all of a sudden you can start tutoring now. You have to volunteer. You need to start a tutoring business this weekend. (laughs) You think I'm joking. No, it's just interesting because a lot of people even say to me like, wow, you look like a teacher and say that to me. And I, I'm just like, okay. Validation. Validation. Huh? Right there. I mean, everybody knows you. It's like, you even freaking look like a teacher. Yeah. Now, here's my point. Um, do you have a college degree? No, I only have a certification in biblical okay, studies. All right, so here's the point. You can't teach in a public school, and that may not be your jam anyway, but let me tell you what you can do. You can get some more certifications that would allow you to do some maybe training in certain areas. You're not limiting yourself to kids and math and creative writing. You know, I wonder in Hartford, Connecticut, where are there any local government um, agencies or, or state agencies where uh, maybe they need people to teach immigrants English language or yeah, I'm making stuff up. 
I'm literally just ideating right now. None of those things may be the thing you want to do, but I can tell you this, you don't need to be volunteering. You need to start a tutoring service this weekend. And I'm going to say it again. And you know what you do? You go on Facebook uh, or you email all your friends. You start bulletin boarding it and you go, hey, if you need a tutor for this, 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 and this, I'm your gal. Here's my phone number and email. Love to hear from you. And you set your rate. You do a little research and you figure out what the rate is and you start tutoring. And then you start going on job boards this weekend and start looking for jobs that you've got the qualifications for that just require, hey, maybe entry-level training or whatever for this organization. Maybe I can get an HR and do some training there. But as long as you are instructing and training and guiding people, you're going to be a happy camper, yes or no? Yes. All right, then. Hang on the line. I'm going to help you a little bit more. I'm going to give you the Get Clear Assessment. I want you to take it. I'm going to give you the proximity principle and paycheck to purpose to help you along the way. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Thanks for listening to the Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.